Hello, I'm Peter Merrill speaking for the Xscale Alliance. This video is both a progress report and an invitation for business and technical folks to get directly involved in an agile moonshot, a plan applying business agility and descaling DevOps to the problem of bureaucracy all around the world. Over the past two years, we've run a series of experiments called the Game Without Thrones. These were two-hour workshops where groups of up to 160 collaborated on a single objective using zero command and control. No masters, no managers, no owners, and no pre-made backlogs. Pure autonomy and alignment. We ran dozens of these experiments across the Americas, Europe, UK, India, and Australasia. And they always worked. So now, instead of two hours and Lego castles, we're working on hackathons of two days, open source, but real code for real products and still zero command and control. We can prove that. We can prove the same thing within corporations, within public sector, service, organizations, you name it. And we ran our first Code Without Thrones experiment just this weekend and it worked out great and we learned a lot and I can't wait to show it to you. A lot of people haven't played a game like Minecraft before. Now this is not Minecraft, this is the open source version of it. it's called Mind Test. And it's even more confusing to begin with. So we have this nice, safe little convention center kind of a place where people can find their legs and their arms and their eyes and in general try to figure out how to orient themselves in what is initially a very strange environment. Uh, the first challenge for anybody getting into this stage of the experiment is just to be able to move around and uh, go upstairs. So here we've got some stairs. It's very easy to fall off the end of the stairs. So if, if you are careful, you can walk up the stairs. And walking up the stairs, oops, let's see. Oh, I've walked into a little cubby. Didn't mean to do that. Um, walking up the stairs gets you to a level where there are various interesting things, but the most interesting things up here, there are six rooms, one for each of six teams. Now, for uh, our first um, embodiment of this experiment, that's plenty of teams for us to be playing with. Uh, we're talking about teams that are six people each. Just being able to manipulate what's going on around you to understand things is initially quite challenging, and that's why we've got this very safe little environment. Uh, I can, for example, decide I want to put on some boots as well. Um, let's say I'll put them over here. Um, it didn't work very well. Oh, it did work. Okay. This is not about Minecraft. This is not about mind test. Uh, this is about how do we get people to a place where they can start to collaborate in a different way. So let's see. After they, after they get the hang of running around here, what we found in the event we ran on the weekend was that People, um, almost immediately, they turn into two-year-olds and they start trying to destroy things. And that's not a bad idea here because we've basically got um, an environment where you can dig holes in things and you can, you can place uh, blocks in the world that you might happen to have and so on. So you can learn how to... Um, do terrible things. So uh, on the weekend we had people placing fire all over the place and burning trees down. And, oh, I haven't even shown you the trees yet. And uh, placing unstoppable fountains on the roof. This entire house flooded. And in general, people run around um, doing things that, well, they can do here. They can't do in real life. It's it's uh, like jumping from level to level. Um, it takes about 45 minutes before they get bored with that. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd like to say that everybody is uh, very rational and sober when they get involved in something like this, but the fact is, they're not. Uh, if you're having a, a, a two-day hackathon, uh, then you want to explore the world and you want to try things out. Um, that 
big glowy thing over there is a volcano. Pay no attention to that. Um, now, eventually, once everybody's calmed down and stopped setting fire to things, and maybe had a bit of an explore around here, uh, we had a, a, a mass slaughter of, um, of a herd of sheep the first time we played this. Anyway, eventually we go, okay, everybody's calmed down to the point where they actually want to try building things rather than destroying things. So we have a different environment for that. We take them off here. This is a teleporter, and it teleports us to this little village. Now, to show you this village, I'm going to fly. The players don't actually get to fly um, until they get to the third part of the game, which is where they're trying to build a castle together to defend them from an imminent invasion by a vast army of ice zombies. Anyone who's seen Game of Thrones knows what I mean. Uh, to begin with, though, things are much more orderly than that. So um, if I zip up a li little bit, uh, you can see the world is actually an awful lot bigger than a convention center. We, we pair all the players up, and each pair of players uh, is challenged to make a little house for themselves. We haven't really started doing Code Without Thrones yet. But to tell the truth, we're not going to until we've done some of the Game Without Thrones dynamics. We have a long video on those in the Xscale podcast series, but here's a summary. Even with 160 people in the group, we need no meetings larger than six. Yet all our decisions are made face to face. We achieve this through a pattern of cross-cutting chapters and rotating councils. Every business or product metric is assigned to a distinct chapter. Here we're building robots that build castles, so all our metrics are about the qualities of castles. Each squad includes members of all the chapters. A squad makes intelligent trade-offs between chapter metrics for the product feature it's delivering by a simple protocol called leadership as a service. Every 15 minutes, we break across the stream of three squads into chapter meetings. Chapters originate features to build and propose alignments between squads' ways of working. But chapters are independent, so their treaties may be contradictory. So we form a stream council to refactor the treaties into a consistent set. It's made of one representative per chapter, which means two per squad. We rotate the membership round robin so everyone gets a turn with no middle managers. While the stream council meets, the other squad members either refactor the product or meet in cross-stream chapters, and we'll see those turn up in just a moment. Squads align on which treaties to accept or reject. The council can't overrule any squad, instead the squads use leadership as a service and face-to-face -face horse trading. The members of the stream councils that will meet next time all take part in cross-stream chapters. Each of these originates epics and cross-stream treaties. And each picks a single representative to sit on the portfolio council. The portfolio council refactors the treaties and prioritizes the epics across the streams. Next, the councils reform, the stream councils do, uh, they align on assignment of epics to their streams. They also make intelligent trade-offs between proposed treaties. None can overrule any other, and the Portfolio Council can't overrule them either. Autonomy applies at every level. And then they all return to their squads and get back to delivery. The rotation scheme for all of this is written down in advance to make it easy to know who's doing what when. So it's a lot like a square dance. Really simple after the first cycle and really effective. Now, uh, we began uh, just this last weekend with uh, three pairs of players. Actually, I don't think we had eight at, at, the, at the height, but uh, initially we had um, three pairs and they built these three little houses. This, this one with a red roof and this one with a very nice uh, sort of Frank Lloyd Wright glass roof kind of an idea. And then... Uh, I think there's another glass roof one over here. Evidently, these players all like the idea of sunshine. So those ones are all built. The rest of the village is actually just mocked up. There's nothing inside any of those buildings. Now, I'll show you what got built uh, by the end of the first day. But we had an immediate problem. Um, here's where they were building. Over here. Because so the idea is all of the villagers, of course there are no villagers evident, but the idea is they're supposed to be villagers. All of those villagers are um, 
they're all under threat. This entire castle was built block by block. Um, and, well, firstly, it was situated. We're used to making decisions by having a group of people all influence a manager. Well, you don't have to have a manager to influence and you still get to an agreement that everybody can act on. So they built this and uh, it's kind of, it's nice. I mean, well, if you like gray, it's nice. Uh, if I drop down, uh, we can have a look. They, they built a little armory uh, so that they'd be able to, to have various kinds of things they could use against the ice zombies, dynamite and swords and things. And it's the kind of stuff that gets built in in these games all the time. What was different was that these guys made all of their decisions about where to build, what to build, how to build together. No one made those decisions for them. We didn't begin with some magical backlog full of stories. All we began with was an epic. And the epic was all about responding to the imminent threat of ice zombies. So that was the end of the first day they got this far. Now, um, the second day, we taught everybody the world's simplest programming language. We started that way. Um, actually, we didn't start that way. We started by making certain everybody was in agreement on some of the constraints that we're working with. How many villagers? Uh, what are the capabilities of these ice zombies? How does this uh, solution actually address the problem? So it wasn't just about doing what a product owner said. It was about understanding the business. Now you might go, wait a second, a village and a castle, that's not our business. Well, it's enough of a business for us to have a need to write code. We're going to run our next one of these in August in Sydney. Then we're going to run a joint one, Sydney and Melbourne, in conjunction with the Australian Business Agility Conference in September. And then we're going to run a global one in October. So you'll have lots of opportunities to get involved in this and the ticket prices are ridiculously cheap because it's an experiment. Uh, we are learning together. There's no one standing up front going, aha, here I am the master and you are the student. So let me show you uh, what we got to on the second day and it's going to look a lot less interesting than that. Actually, there's a piece of it here. Uh, if I can find it, maybe over here. Uh, ah, there it is. It might not look very interesting. Uh, you see, you see this um, this wall here. This one that little X mark is or crosshairs is on. Well, that was built by this little robot here. That little box. That's a robot. Not the most exciting robot in the world. Um, but it can do anything that a player can do. So you might go, well, wait a second, building a wall? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the most astonishing thing. And it's not. Um, but we didn't know how to do it. So getting to a place where we could actually lay courses of blocks one on top of another, that was an interesting programming challenge because these robots, you see, don't have an ability to fly. And without an ability to fly, how do you get them to go up levels? Uh, it, it becomes quite an interesting challenge. Now we've got the code to do that, so uh, we're not going to be experimenting with that any further. Now we can build walls. Well, we're going to um, and build walls on top of walls. We're going to be able to now build castles in our next Code Without Thrones hackathon. And then things are going to start getting really fancy because uh, what we'd really like to do is those ice zombies I mentioned we'd like to have the robots be the ice zombies. So once we've got robots that can build castles, we're gonna to have to start building robots that can be ice zombies. Now, I've gotten way ahead of myself. The fact is, probably before we have robots that can be ice zombies, we want to use code without thrones in open source projects so that we can uh, experience this stuff with systems that are a little bit less playful than this, with stuff where there's really hard constraints. I'm just going to fix the light here. If I go uh, time, let's make it morning. Uh, uh, a day is an hour in the way we've got this thing set up. There we go. It's suddenly at six in the morning. Um, now, what I want to do is I want to show you where we really had a success on the uh, on the second day. And 
It's over on the other side of those villages. So let me go find it. Um, here we go. Now. The other side of this village. This is where we had those houses built before. Uh, we'll see something interesting, if I recall where it is correctly. Here we go. Uh, those are the houses. Ah, now, you see there's this glass tower that reaches up just about as far as the eye can see. That was built by a robot with a two uh, a two line program. All it did was place a block under itself and jump. Very, very simple. Just did that over and over and over again. So, over here, we have a set of wall building experiments. And again, you'll be able to see the robot that built them. What's interesting about this one was the speed with which these robots built these walls. Um, to build that castle, as I said, uh, it, it took us the better part of uh, um, an afternoon to get that castle built. All of these walls were built in less than a second. So um, uh, here we finally really began to get a hang on why these robots were so important. If we're going to build towering castles and thick castles, the kinds of things that are going to stop ice zombies that are themselves robots, um, we're going to have to have uh, other robots maintaining those castles as they go. It's going to be really um, an interesting challenge. But the whole point of this is not the challenge, it's not the code, it's not the game. The point of what we're doing is learning how to use the Game Without Thrones patterns with real, large, multinational, multi-time zone uh, groups and still require no command and control. Uh, I really am looking forward to seeing you all at um, the next three Code Without Thrones events. If you have any professional interest in DevOps, if you have any professional interest in business agility, this is the absolute cutting edge of um, those disciplines. Uh, you, um, you will learn things in doing this that you cannot learn uh, by going and taking some waffly course where someone is banging on about uh, multisyllabic words. So anyway, um, you are all invited and um, uh, we're going to have so much fun with this, but more to the point, we're going to learn so much with this. So thank you all for watching. Take care.